Please turn with me to Mark 12, verses 13 through to 17 this morning. I'm entitled this morning, Total Devotion. Total Devotion. It's sweetness and it's sourness. Total Devotion. It's sweetness and it's sourness. We're returning this Sunday to this episode that we looked at together last week, to this controversy between the religious leaders and our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Really in these verses there are three parts. There's the first part is the question at the end of verse 14 and beginning of 15. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? To pay or not to pay, that is the question. That's the first part. But secondly, there's then two parts from verse 17. First of all, we are told by Jesus to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And then the third part is we are told to render to God the things that are God's. So those are the three parts. The question, rendering to Caesar, and then rendering to God's. Noting, as we did last week, that the question, the question of the Pharisees and the Herodians, reveals to us something about human resistance to God. We're in a fierce conflict in a spiritual battle. And last Sunday, I was keen to expose that third point of what this question reveals to us about the human heart. I wanted to show that sin is much more than, but nevertheless involves, selfishness. Sin is much more than selfishness, but don't kid yourself, it involves selfishness. It seems that the most defended kingdom on earth is the kingdom of self. It seems that we've all employed an inner lawyer who jumps to our defence and seeks to justify us at every turn. The moment anybody gives a mild word of criticism, even in the home, isn't it? It's bang, he's earning his fees the inner lawyer. The heart behind the question is too easy to pass over. And that's why we looked at it last week as we did. But mindful that the first point about Caesar might be something which may not be that familiar with some of us here this morning. We're returning, but we're going to start at the end this week. First of all, with a big issue that comes out of this confrontation. We're going to look at two issues And then we'll look at two things that reveals. What's the big issue to emerge here, rather like an iceberg coming out of the water? What's the issue that dominates the landscape? It's not their question. It's Jesus' answer. And particularly that we are to render to God the things that are God's. That's the big issue I want to deal with first this morning. The very famous words of Jesus, render to Caesar that which is Caesar's, render to God that which is God's. I want to say three things. First of all, it isn't the issue he was asked about. He was asked about something else. But this is the issue which emerges. And that's Jesus of Nazareth, isn't it? Jesus' answers often raise the level of conversation. He's at Sychar, he meets a Samaritan woman, she comes for water in the middle of the day, and they talk about the water that's down in the well, and Jesus raises the conversation, doesn't he, to the spiritual plane, and talks of a fountain of water springing up to eternal life. He answers her by raising the conversation to the needs of her soul, not just her body. In John chapter 6, he's been feeding the 5,000 just with five loaves and two fish. And having dealt with that, he then says to them, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. I can do more than satisfy your body with water and with bread. I've come to satisfy your soul eternally. I'm the living bread. He deals, moves from the physical up to the need of the soul. When he first calls Simon and Andrew, he sees them casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he says to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He starts with their fishing and he raises it to the issues of salvation and the soul. Here he does exactly the same thing. 
From the issue of Caesar's authority, he raises it substantially, infinitely, to the authority of God. And that's a pattern, isn't it, that we'd love to follow and to use well, to prayerfully, with grace, be able to speak to people and lift the conversation, pointing to our Lord Jesus Christ. To win not the argument or the points, but to win souls. Why does he answer in this way? Why does he answer with an answer which doesn't answer their question, but something bigger? And the answer is because this morning, though he is concerned for you and your body and your mind, his great concern for you this morning and for me is the soul. Nobody cares for your soul like Jesus of Nazareth cares for your soul. He has real, genuine, authentic compassion towards you. You may be uncomfortable with the introduction of spiritual matters, of a holy God, of our sin, your sin, of the judgment that we will face, of the salvation which is only found in Jesus, not by us becoming good or religious, And by the realities of heaven and of hell, you might be uncomfortable with that. But in Jesus Christ, you have someone who, in this, is more on your side than you are. He cares for you this morning with regard to your relationship with God and your sin and the judgment which you will face when you see him and the salvation which you can know in the Lord Jesus Christ and the heaven you can know and the hell you can shun. It's not the issue raised, but it's the iceberg which emerges from the sea, as it were. Second point, still under render to God, Jesus answers, always answer the heart issue of the questioners. He's always answering their heart, not necessarily their words. We're going to see that next time with the Sadducees from verse 24. He says to them, Particularly, you are to render to God the things that are God, and within that, you are to render the things that are Caesar's. You are to do both, but you are to render everything to God, and within that, it is your due to render to Caesar's that which is Caesar. He's dealing with their hearts. And the third thing about rendering to God the things that are God's is simply this. As I said last week, it's such a reasonable answer, isn't it? It's such a reasonable demand upon us that we give back to God the things that are God's. As we sang in our first song this morning, he's the source of everything, isn't he? Imagine just for a moment the first moments of Adam's life. You you, you suddenly exist. And you suddenly got things that are going to be called hands. And you can see, but you don't call it seeing. And Astonishing, isn't it? Just created out of the dust of the earth and God breathes in him. And surely then he knows that everything has come from God. And that he's to render everything back to God. He finds himself existing in the image of the invisible God. He must know the truth that's not later declared until acts that God has given life and breath and all things to everyone. He learns then that all things, as we read in Romans 11, 36, are from God and through God and to God. Because where's it all come from? What are the things that are God's? Well, our existence and our eyes and our ears and our minds and our thoughts and our hearts and our desires and our hands We're to give them all back to God in glad service. As Paul says in Romans 6, possibly the greatest chapter in the Bible, present yourselves to God. The whole lot. Because it belongs to him. It's reasonable, isn't it? He's given us our time. We give our time back and spend it in a way which is pleasing to him. He's given us all our possessions. Our duty and our delight is to live in a way which brings glory and honour to our creator. That's why we're here. That's the sweetness of total devotion to him 
It was there with Adam and Eve. It's going to be there in the new heavens. We long to know more of it now, don't we? Rendering to the God who is eternal and infinitely powerful and boundlessly wise. It's completely reasonable, isn't it? To live entirely for his honour. I hope you can see it's a beautiful thing, a sweet thing. Imagine someone who you knew was wise and loving and righteous and they instructed you in the very best way to live out of love. It's a no-brainer, isn't it? And we largely recognise the authority, don't we, still, of the parent and the teacher and the policeman for good. But we need to recognise the authority of God with whom there is no abuse. It's not just our duty, it's our delight to live in harmony, to live in accordance with his way and his word, pleasing him. God rightfully has absolute authority over everything. And his authority is communicated in speech. Out of nothing he speaks and he commands, and we read in Psalm 33, and it, it was so. Out of nothing the universe is created, the authority of God. The winds and the waves obeyed the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus in Luke 7 met the centurion, the centurion, remember, had got a servant who needed healing. And in the end, the servant says, well, you don't, the centurion says, you don't need to come, just say the word. Look, I'm a man under authority, and there are people that are under my authority, and I say, go, and they go, and they come, and they come. Just say the word. You've only got to speak, Lord Jesus. You have authority. And so Jesus says the word, and then in the next scene, he <laughs> commands a dead son to rise from his coffin. And the dead son sits up and begins to speak. His absolute authority and our absolute commitment to him is reasonable, total allegiance to the ultimate authority. And that's harder, isn't it, than rendering to Caesar what's Caesar's? But here's the sourness, and then we'll move on. In a sense, by introducing the law, we're being shown a problem with our hearts, aren't we? Because neither you or I this morning have rendered everything to God, have we? And we certainly haven't in the last week, have we? And the last month, years, we just haven't done it. We've resisted his authority. We've shown how far we are fallen. We've shown our need of a saviour to forgive us and reconcile us. That's the sourness. We don't do it. Because we all like sheep have gone astray. And yet it's a beautiful thing. There in the beginning, there for an eternity for believers, we long to know more of it now. Second point. Render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. Why does Jesus say Caesar? Well, Tiberius Caesar was the Roman emperor, we believe, at this time, 14 to 37 A.D. So let's just go back 2,000 years and understand the situation. The Romans were the occupiers, right? They're the bad guys, to the Jews particularly. And so Caesar levies taxes to fund, expo to fund expenditure, some of which was for the benefit of the common good. So they had to pay the imperial poll tax with a denarii, which was a day's wage, a coin. And that authority which Caesar had to raise taxes was demonstrated in the coinage which was issued on which was his image. But remember that he was considered to be divine, so to the Jew this was speaking even of idolatry, not just of unpleasant occupiers they wanted shot of, but of their idolatry. And so part of the question is, why is it lawful to pay taxes to an unwanted occupier through coins that remind us of idolatry. Why is it lawful to pay taxes to an unwanted occupier through coins that remind us of idolatry? Well, Caesar stands for governing authorities, the equivalent today, Shepshed Town Council, the Borough Council and Westminster. They all provide services, they all levy taxes. 
And Jesus in his day establishes that this is fair and right, that we are to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, an obligation of payment for services rendered. It's something that he is establishing here. Which means for us, because Caesar's not around today, that we are to submit to the governing authorities, the equivalent of our Caesar today and their taxes. Their authority is God-given. Remember when Jesus meets the Roman governor Pilate, he says, you wouldn't have any authority unless it was given to you. Given to you by God. You do have an authority, but you wouldn't have it unless God had given it to you. And that authority is limited to the sphere of civil government. We're going to talk about this next this morning. Just remind ourselves we are to submit to the authority of God, which is limitless. Rendering to Caesar requires paying taxes. Rendering to God requires total obedience. But both God and Caesar have legitimate realms of authority. God is absolute within which he's decreed that authority for government must be recognized. So we looked at rendering to God. We're now looking at rendering to Caesar. There isn't Caesar today. No, but there are civic and civil authorities and government. And you might be surprised to know that the Bible actually teaches about these things. It's one focus that it has. You can read about it mostly in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 13, 1 Timothy chapter 2, Titus verse 3, and 1 Peter chapter 2, where we're told to pray for kings and all who are in authority. We're told to be subject to rulers and authorities. We're told to submit to every ordinance or institution of man for the Lord's sake, whether they be kings or governors. Paul says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Nothing new in that. In the Old Testament, Daniel had said that God sets up kings and deposes them. There is a civic government, and God has given it a proper rightful sphere of authority. There is no authority except from God. The authorities, the Bible says, that exist are appointed by God. Now, that doesn't mean that God favors constitutional monarchy or a republic or an oligarchy or a democracy. The, the type isn't in view. We cannot say this morning that God is Republican or Democrat, Tory, Socialist, or Lib Dem. But he does, for the good of society, establish government institutions. And this applies everywhere. So this word would apply to Christians this morning in North Korea and in Russia, and in Uzbekistan, and in Somalia, and in Yemen. It's still God's word. These governing authorities are, quote from the Bible, Romans 13, 4, God's minister to you for good. Because of this you also pay taxes, render therefore to all their due taxes to whom taxes are due. It's there. It should promote justice for all, do good, upholding just laws, punishing wrongdoers, protecting the weak, and the innocent promoting peace and order in society. But it has its limits. And of course, there was a big question for some of us as to whether the government or governments around the world went beyond their limits during the COVID crisis. We can argue about that one later. It has a sphere of influence, but it is to be restricted to civil matters. So when, not long after this incident, the early church runs into conflict with the authorities because Peter and John are commanded not to speak or teach in Jesus' name, what do they do? Well, in Acts 5, they recognized the leaders as rulers, but they questioned their right to be able to legislate in this area. And when the situation was repeated, they said, we must obey God rather than men. And this is the Christian's duty when conflict arises. If there's a conflict between what the local government or the national government is telling us to do and what the Bible tells us to do, 
then we obey God, not men, and we face the consequences. There's an exception, as we see. But our responsibilities are that rendering everything to God involves us, whether we like it or not, rendering things to Caesar. It's not pick and choose. Political and civil duties must be considered as expressions of our ultimate rendering to God. The Christian life involves being a Christian in every sphere. It's a whole life of honouring the Lord every dimension. And so we are entitled to see our rights as citizens upheld and to use the law when, for example, our liberty is threatened. We are to submit to the governing authorities. We are to be law-abiding citizens. We should be the best citizens. It's part of our overall obedience to God. We're to live as salt and light. We're told to honour the king. We're told to pray for our civil leaders. We're to evangelise them when possible, to respectfully confront them. We're to be involved in civil authority according to gifts and calling. But we recognise that it's the gospel that's the remedy to the world's problems, not political power. But we are to render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. And I don't know whether you consider that to be sweet this morning or sour. When it comes to the paying of taxes, most of us seem to think it's sour. And I would just say this, that as part of our overall obedience to God, we are to render to Caesar that which is Caesar's, and we ought to do it sweetly. Because it doesn't honour God for us to do it sourly. Doesn't honour God if we do it reluctantly in a disdaining way. We're to be willing and loving. So let's render to God the things that belong to God and render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's sweetly. That leads us on to two points and then we finish. Word of God's glorious, isn't it? The way that it <laughs> causes pain as it opens up your heart. You see, here we come again, don't we? Thirdly, we render to God, we render to Caesar. Now we see the matter of the heart, which is the heart of the matter. It's the battle, isn't it? There's a battle going on in here, there's a battle going on in here. Jesus opposes the leaders who've come to him. He threatens their authority, and they threaten his. And they've done that since the start of Mark's gospel, haven't they? And here it's persistent, isn't it? We've seen once already, we're going to see it next week and the week after and the week after. People coming and questioning Jesus because they want to evade their responsibility that he really is God and King. You see, there is a kingdom of self, isn't there? Sin is more than but includes selfishness. And the advancement of the kingdom of God is subversive activity. The advancement of the kingdom of God is subversive activity. It undermines the power and authority of the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of self. That's what I love about the prayer meeting, frankly. It's the most subversive hour we can spend together in the week. Praying. Praying that the power and authority of the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of self will be undermined and overthrown by the kingdom of Jesus. That's why the Sanhedrin feel threatened here. They sought to undermine the kingdom of God. They had them from the start. Remember the Apostle Paul, he thought it was his religious duty to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus. And these people, blinded in their religious activity, thought they were doing God a favour by opposing the Lord Jesus Christ. And we said last week, they are strange bedfellows, the Herodians and the Pharisees, but united against a common enemy, they seek to undermine the authority of Jesus. From their heart. And that's the real sourness, isn't it? We saw last week that it involved for them 
And we are far from immune from this. It involved them in their pride, in their hypocrisy, pretending outwardly to be something that inwardly they weren't. It involved flattery, saying to Jesus what was true, but flattery is not just puffing somebody else up, it's puffing them up that they think better of you because you've puffed them up. Which this week struck me as extraordinary that recognising that Jesus courted no favour, they should try flattery on him. They'd already said that his integrity wasn't swayed by others. He didn't show personal favouritism, so <laughs> why try flattery? They revealed their pride and their hypocrisy and their flattery and their deception and their unwillingness, seeking to be crafty and turning the tables on him and doing what he'd just done to them by giving him an either-or question. And he answers both and. Why do you test me, he says? If you're in these shoes this morning, why don't you acknowledge the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ? Why do you test me? He says, you know, what, what, have, what have I ever done for you? I mean, I've cleansed the leper, I, I've healed the sick, I've preached the kingdom of God, I, I've raised the dead. What have I ever done to you? And they tested him to discredit him from his own mouth amongst the Jews so that they could hand him over to the Romans or get him to antagonize the Romans such that they would arrest him. If he'd answered one way or the other, he'd have either antagonized the Jews or he would have antagonized the Romans, as we saw last week. And their reasoning together, as we've seen in Mark before, is simply they wanted to evade the consequences and silence his claims that he's God and he's king. And isn't that what some of us want to do here this morning? Silence the claim that Jesus Christ is alive, risen, exalted, he's God, that all power and authority has been given to him and that you are wholly dependent upon him and accountable to him. What's he ever done to you? Other than claim complete authority for good, which you resist. That's sour isn't it? Sourness to the taste. But we end with sweetness. We're to render to God the things that are God's. We're to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. The very instruction to do that reminds us, humbles us, reminding us of the reality of our hearts and our sinfulness and our separation from God. But we end with the good news. You know, he alone is God. He alone has complete authority. He's perfectly wise. He's perfectly loving. He's a God who is good. We read these words in the New Testament. Oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? We read it in the Old Testament. You've turned things upside down as if the potter were regarded as clay. Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, he didn't make me. Can the pottery say to the potter, he has no understanding? We can't, can we? He's God. It's wise and it's reasonable that we render all to him. Though the Bible depicts a long history of resistance and rejection as we've seen in recent weeks, and we find that rejection, some of us, still in our hearts. And that rebellion to God and that rebellion to the Lord Jesus Christ reached a particular peak, didn't it, once in time. When Jesus was nailed to a cross and he died, and Jesus' claims looked to have been silenced once and for all. And his enemies must have gone, phew. But the Bible says he has authority to lay down his life and authority to take it up again. 
And the parable at the beginning of this chapter reminds us that the stone that was rejected, Jesus Christ, becomes the chief cornerstone of the building. He is the foundation of God's salvation to wayward men, women, and young people. There is a holy God, there is a terribly sinful people, and yet God has so loved them that he sent his only begotten Son, that whoever would believe upon him wouldn't perish as they deserve to perish, but rather would have everlasting life and forgiveness of their sins. The peak of man's hostility to Jesus is they nail him to the cross, but the cross is the wisdom and power of God. Where the Son of God, who is the image of the invisible God, has, yes, men do their worst to him. Lawless hands take hold of him and crucify, we're told, the innocent one. But in that death, he who is God, in total devotion to his people, lays down his life and offers that life in a cursed death as a sacrifice of atonement to turn aside God's wrath from us, to have it fall upon him. The sweetness that he was dying for us, to save us from our sins, the sourness was he was being made sin and a curse. Such was his love. And my question this morning is, won't you follow him? Won't you humble your proud heart and submit to his authority, renouncing your foolish, stupid, ugly, rebellious resistance to God? Won't you come to him who tasted the sourness of death to bring the sweetness of everlasting life to all who would believe? And if you're here this morning, then go on denying self, taking up your cross and following him. And all because of a love, of a total devotion that demands our souls, our life, our all. Oh, that there be a change in our hearts, that we would more and more love him, ever, only, all, ever, only, all for him. In a daily repentance and faith recognizing that our duty and delight is to come to him in full and in glad surrender. Have you done that? Won't you do it today? May you today experience the victory of the sweetness of the Savior over the sourness and vileness of your sin. For Christ's sake. Amen.